I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. I know y'all just sat down, but I'm going to invite you to stand again, get a little workout in this morning, some squats, Paul squats. Um, our scripture this morning, we're going to be coming from Psalms chapter one. Um, so I'm going to read it and then, uh, yeah, I'm going to walk back and we're going to go through God's word together. So I'm going to read it, I'm going to pray and then invite you to join in celebrating God's word. Um, Psalm chapter one, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted beside or by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And pray for us. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. God, I pray that during this time that we can know more about you. Father God, I pray that you can speak through me. Give me the words to say. Let me hide behind your words and your truths. God, I pray for the hearts. Pray that they will be open to hear what you have to say. God, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Man. Um, So a lot of us in here, we, uh, we drive, we drive cars and some of us drive those cars really, really fast. Uh, but anytime we're driving, a lot of times what happens is, uh, you know, we get on the expressway and when we're on the expressway, there are opportunities for us to, uh, change lanes. There are opportunities for us to, uh, move from one lane to another, but if we change lanes aggressively, or if we change lanes um, sporadically, we're an accident waiting to happen. It could be really, really bad. So when we're on, a hot, on the highway, proper driving etiquette would be to stay in your lane. And then when the opportunity presents itself, we should move from one lane to another. I think a lot of times in life when we look at this passage and kind of what it's laid out to us, there are a couple paths that we can take in life. And sometimes when we take those paths, we're, we're, we're in a lane, but sometimes it may be the wrong lane. And if we're not careful, we can either stay in the wrong lane or we can jump sporadically to a different lane and we miss the lane that God really wants us to be in. I think it's important to realize that God has laid out his lane um, for us and he's given us his word. He's given us his, 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 his word, he's given us his truth, and he wants us to stay in the lane that he's written for us. Yes. And the reason why he wants us to stay in that lane is because he understands that we can avoid accidents when we don't. So he starts off this psalm and he, he talks to us about how we can stay in this lane, how we can stay in the lane that God has called us to. And if I can put a tag on the text, I hope, yeah, thank you, Gibby, I appreciate that. Um, the tag I want to put on this text is two paths, your choice. Two paths, your choice. Because at the end of the day, we all have a choice to make. We all have a decision to make when it comes to the truth, when it comes to our path, when it comes to our final destination. 
And before we get to our final destination, God has laid out and said, hey, I'm going to give you a choice. And it's actually the choice that we've been struggling with since the beginning of time. A lot of times I think back to uh, Genesis. And in Genesis uh, chapter 2, God plants two trees in the garden. And what's interesting is a lot of times we only focus on one tree. We focus on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But there are two trees in the garden, not one. And Adam and Eve was faced with a choice between two trees. And we're faced with that choice every single day. Are we going to pick the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or are we going to pick the tree of life that leads to him? Two paths... But it's your choice. He starts this psalm off and uh, he says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He starts off and he talks about how we can be blessed. What does blessing look like? What does God mean when he says, blessed is the man? Well, if I can put a definition on this, this is to enjoy God's favor and God's grace in our life. How we can truly live a life of contentment and happiness in him. But if I can be honest, a lot of times I think we have miscontextualized this word of blessing. The other day I was on Facebook and there was this guy, he was uh, talking about, I was just scrolling through and uh, he, he, he's talking about uh, basketball. And before he starts talking about basketball, he talks about all the things that God has done in his life. And I'm like, oh snap, we got a biblical basketball trainer. Yeah. Praise God for that. And he continues his conversation and he says, man, God has blessed me so much. And I'm like, oh man, he about to preach, he about to say something. And my man started saying, man, God has given me a nice car. God has given me a, a, a home in a gated community. God has, has, has blessed me with, and he said, he said, man, I'm sitting here, I'm able to drink and, and watch basketball for five to six hours a day. And I'm like, no. No. We, we, we've missed it because that's not true blessing. Because if I equate blessing with just stuff, if I equate blessing with just things that I have, if that's what I call being blessed, what do you say to the person who doesn't have those things? Is, is, is that person now not blessed because he has less? I, I don't think that's the case. So he says, blessed is the man, I love what Charles Spurgeon says because uh, Charles Spurgeon says, uh, it doesn't say blessed is the king. It doesn't say blessed is the scholar and it doesn't say blessed is the rich man. It says blessed is the man, meaning that this blessing is for everybody. Yeah. Only if you would come to him. So he says blessed is the man and we have to make sure that we understand what that blessing is so that we don't miss who God is in the middle of us trying to acquire stuff in the midst of trying to acquire things. And understand what I'm saying. And I've said this multiple times. I'll say it again. God is not against you having things. He's not against you having stuff. He's against stuff having you where that's what's occupying your mind, your time, and your thoughts. He is against that because he wants to, we'll get into that in a second. So the issue is we have this next view of blessing, but this, he tells us, he says, blessed is the man, and then he tells us what this person does not do. And he walks us through this progression of sorts of how we can slowly start to get off this path and ultimately end up in the wrong lane. He says, blessed is the man, he says, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, and doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. The first thing he says is, he says, walk in the counsel of the wicked. When you think about someone walking, you think about their life. You think about how they're living. You think about these things. And he says, they don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. The word that sticks out to me in the middle of that is this word, counsel. This is talking about the way that I'm thinking the way that I'm processing. 
And the question we have to ask is, who are we going to when we are in the process of thinking and figuring things out? He says the blessed man, it says he, he doesn't walk in the counsel of, of the wicked. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, who is influencing our thinking? Who is the main voice in our lives? Because he says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. A lot of times I, 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 I find myself on uh, social media and there are a lot of things that sound really, really good. They sound great, especially if you're in a bad spot, you're trying to get out of a circumstance and some pops up and you're like, man, I was dealing with that. And it sounds great. But just because it sounds great, that doesn't mean it comes from God. Just because it sounds good, it doesn't mean that it comes from him or it doesn't come from his word. So we have to be very cautious about the things that we're putting into our lives. We have to be. I always think about, um, like if I take a tube of toothpaste and I squeeze it, what's going to come out? I hope toothpaste. <laughs> If peanut butter comes out, I got to go talk to Colgate. We got some problems. If I have some orange juice and I turn it upside down, what's going to come out? It better not be milk. Because me and Tropicana are going to have some issues. And the point behind that is when life squeezes us and life turns upside down, whatever we're putting on the inside is ultimately what's going to come out. It's going to. So we have to be very cautious about not walking in the counsel of the wicked. But sometimes we put a lot of emphasis on other people and we don't put emphasis on ourselves. Because sometimes we can counsel ourselves to do wicked things. Sometimes we can talk ourselves into doing things that are against God. Or we can lie to ourselves. We can trick ourselves. We're we really good at that. And he says, don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. But then the next part of this progression, he says, uh, he says uh, don't stand in the way of sinners. So now we've gone from thinking to behaving. We've gone from this process of, of, of thought to now it's an action. And I wholeheartedly believe that Satan wants to start with our minds so he can get us acting in ways that are against God. Because usually what happens is thoughts turn into actions. And then actions turn into habits. And then habits turn into lifestyles. There's a progression to this thing. And he says, don't stand in the way of sinners, meaning don't be comfortable in a sinful lifestyle. I get a chance to talk to athletes all the time. And I talked to one a couple weeks ago. And he's struggling with some things. Uh, and what's interesting is, as we were talking about this, uh, some of the stuff that he was struggling with, um, he started talking about his environment. He started talking about the people that were around him. And he said, man, he said, this lifestyle that I don't want to live, he said, the, the, the people that I'm around, it, it, it's just so, you, they're, they're used to this. And it's so hard for me not to identify with that because I'm always around it. I'm always hanging out with them. We practice together all the time. We hang out together all the time. And he's saying, man, I, I am practicing in the way of sinners. That's what he told me. And my response to him was like, man, I love the fact that you have two sides waging war in your heart right now. And if I can give you a vote of confidence, if you're in a struggle of sin and you're trying to figure this thing out, praise God if you are struggling with it. Praise God if you have two sides warring in your heart right now because that means that God's side is still there. If you don't have two sides waging war, that means one side has already won. It's not a good place to be in, but praise God if you're struggling with that because that means there's hope to be out of that. He says, don't stand in the way of sinners, meaning don't adopt that lifestyle. Don't compromise God's word. Don't adopt it. But then he says, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Now we've gone from thinking to behaving to now this person is belonging. This is my people. These are my folks. This is how I'm living and I'm enjoying it. 
this person has shifted where their loyalty truly lies. And my hope and prayer is that if you are in the middle of this progression, that you don't get to this point where you have a sense of belonging to the wrong path. But if you're here this morning, there's hope because you don't have to stay in that path. Praise God for that. You don't have to stay in a place where you feel like, man, this is life. Why is that? Because that means you're not content. You're not happy. Blessed is the man who doesn't do these things. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse seven, it says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. He's talking about God's law. He's talking about God's instruction. But here's what he says. And shall talk of them. Here's this. When you sit in your house. So Deuteronomy is walking this progression backwards. He's saying, when you sit, you should be focused on God's instruction. Not sitting in the way of or the seat of scoffers. Then he says, uh, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. So you're going to be in progressions of your life of walking, standing, and sitting. That's just going to be, that. you're going to do that. You're sitting right now. So you're going to be in that progression. But the question is, which progression are you leaning towards? Which progression are you going to? And he says, uh, Teach your children this stuff. Don't just stop at you because if I'm teaching, that means that I already know it myself. I'm hanging out in God's word. He says, but, and I love the word but because now we have a contrast here going on. He tells us what they don't do and then he says, but here is what you do do. And he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates on it day and night. I love the word delight there because uh, we, we, we delight in a lot of different things. To delight in something means you don't have to force me to enjoy this. You don't have to beg me to enjoy this thing. I delight in ice cream. I do. I have a problem. I need to go to a, a Edie's Anonymous. But... Uh, <laughs> You don't have to beg me to eat ice cream. You don't have to pull my shirt to go to, go to Haagen-Dazs. You, you don't have to because I delight in that. And in the same way that I delight in ice cream, God is saying delight in my word that same way. I, I, I don't want to have to beg you to spend time with me. I don't want to have to urge you to come visit me. He's saying just simply delight in my law. Enjoy my word. Come, come get to know me for me. Come figure out who I am for yourself. Because when I delight in the law and I delight in God's word, I get to see him on full display. I don't get to pick pieces of him. I get to see all of them. That's beautiful. I, uh, I shared this example the other night with our college students. Um, anybody ever seen a caricature? You know what those are? You go to the um, you go to the uh, to the fair or to the amusement park and you're hanging out and you see these artists and what do these artists do? They start drawing these pictures. And a lot of times, what the artist will do is they will enhance certain features about a person. Usually, it's a feature that person doesn't like, <laughs> right? So if you got a if you got a head that you like, man, I don't know if I like how big my head is. That head is huge on the character. <laughs> it's humongous. Right, some people, they don't like, uh, like if they got a, a neck that they're not fond of, you're going to have a giraffe neck at the end of the caricature. Things going to be humongous. And the, 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 the sad part is, is that you look at the picture and, and the picture is really, really funny, but the, the sad part is that a lot of times we treat God like a caricature. Where we focus too much on certain things that he hasn't told us to enhance. We, we focus too much on pieces of God's law or we focus too much on God's grace or we focus too much on God's wrath and we don't really understand the full picture of who God is. The reason why he says delight in my word is because he says you can know me fully. You can know everything about me if you just delight in my 
in my word. And he says, delight in the law or delight in the instruction. Then he says, on his law, it says he meditates on it day and night. The interesting thing about uh, the word meditation here, uh, when we think about meditation, a lot of times we think about meditation in the Eastern culture. And what they do in Eastern culture to meditate on something, it means to empty everything. I am at peace. I go sit somewhere. I feel this thing called Zen. I don't even know what it is. But you sit in this Zen posture and you just are empty. And the psalmist here is saying, no, I don't want you to empty yourself. That's not what I mean when I say meditate. He's saying, I want you to fill yourself up. It's a contrast. It's a difference. He's saying, I want you to fill yourself up with God's law. And he says, I want you to do it night and day. That means that there is a consistency there. A lot of times, like, you know, I, uh, when I talk with one of, my, one of my soccer guys, he said, so you mean to tell me, Aaron, like, if I'm delighting in the law and, and, and I'm supposed to do this night and day, he's like, how am I going to practice? <laughs> like, you can still go to practice. Like, God don't want you to stop practicing. He's like, so I'm supposed to be like this all day. I'm like, nah, bro, that's not how that works. Because what God is telling us, he's saying, what I, what, I, what I mean by this, what I want you to understand is that I want you to take my word with you throughout your daily interactions. So I, I, I don't want you to just visit me. I want you to hang out with me. I don't want this to be a flyby. I don't want this to be a, you open a Bible app and you just read the scripture and like, well, my streak is at 104 and just keep it moving. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not what God is saying. God is saying, spend time with me, open up my word and, and, and just hang out. And then whatever you hang out with me, when you do it in the morning, he's saying, hey, continue that throughout the day. I love the picture of, uh, anybody know anything about cows? Cows are very interesting animals. If you ever drive by a field, you'll see a cow and the cow will just be in the field and the cow will just be doing this. All day. And the interesting thing is you can watch a cow for hours and not see them go get any hay and they'll just be sitting there like this. Like, hey, bro, what you chewing on, man? <laughs> this man got going on? <laughs> the interesting thing about cows is cows actually have seven stomachs. Seven of them. I don't know why there are seven. God made them. Something about completion. I love ribeyes, so God knew what he was doing. So, he, in, in cow's seven stomachs, they have a place in their stomach where they will chew hay, and then this is kind of nasty, but I'm just going to share it with you. What they will actually do is the hay that they're chewing, they'll swallow it, and then they'll regurgitate it, and then they'll keep chewing on it again. And then they'll swallow it, and then they'll regurgitate it, and they'll keep chewing on it again. So there's this process of swallow, regurgitate, chew. Swallow, regurgitate, chew. Over and over and over. And the cow will keep doing that until every piece of nutrients is pulled out of that hay. They will do it over and over and over and over again. And what God is saying when he says meditate on my law night and day, he's saying regurgitate my truths in your life. He's saying, pull this thing out and keep on chewing on it. Don't just stop at just swallowing it. He's saying, chew on it and chew on it and chew on it. Get every piece of nutrients that I have for you, get it out of my word before you wake up and before you go to sleep, hang out with me. And then do this constantly. He's saying, don't stop. Don't just simply stop at just, oh, the hay was good. No, it wasn't. Taste it again. That's why I love soap journaling, yeah. because you get an opportunity to read scripture. Then you can observe what God is trying to teach you. And then you can. How, how do I apply this thing to my life? Oh, how can I apply this in my in my interactions, in my day in, in my day out? Then I pray on this. God, please show me how I can do this today and how I can keep doing this for the rest of my life. I meditate on it. And I do this, I meditate on it day and night. I don't just stop. So he's saying, meditate on my word. Hang out in my word. So then we get from this, uh, 
contrast of a wicked man and a, and a righteous man and, and what they do. And now we get a chance to see what their lives are like. And the question I want to ask you before we get to this point is, are you planted? He says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit, its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like shaft that the wind drives away. To be planted means to be placed. I, I, I struggle with this word planted over and over again because I never really understood the significance of it. A plant can't plant itself. It's impossible. It, it can't lift itself out of the dirt and go put it in some fresh dirt. Uh, that, okay. It, 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 it can't. <laughs> up, up. Y'all missed it. You missed it. The plant can't plant itself. It cannot pick itself up out of bad dirt and then go place itself in fresh dirt. It has to trust in someone outside of itself to go do that. So the question we have, are you, are you planted? But even deeper, are you trusting the planter? Are you trusting the gardener? If I can be honest, right, sometimes like I trust the gardener with some things. I don't trust him with all things. And uh, the hard part about that is that you can, you can slowly see how that, how that works in our lives. Because certain things in our lives we see, man, this is awesome because I gave it to God. And in other things, it's like, nah, I'll figure that out on my own. I got this. I, I can do that on my own. I'm good on that. And the reality of what happens is, is uh, we, we repent enough to be saved, but we don't surrender enough to be changed. And when you are planted beside streams of water, that means you have a different life. You are different. You have been changed. You are not the same. And if we're being honest, a lot of times we struggle with change because I like me. I like who I am. I like how I think. I like how I act. I like how I move. I like my routines. And God is saying, I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to plant you beside streams of water. Why? It says so that you will yield fruit in its season. The reason why I want to plant you by streams of water is because there is this, this picture of constantly being fulfilled and renewed. There is this picture of, of this consistency in God's word. And God is saying, when I plant you by streams of water, he's saying, this picture is beautiful. Because you got to understand the, the, the time and place that this is being written. Uh, it's a desolate place. It's a dry place. So when this example comes up of a tree that's planted beside streams of water, it's, it's, it's some light bulbs going off. Because I, every, everywhere I look is dry. Everywhere I look, there's no nutrients. Everywhere I look, there's no growth. Everywhere I look, there's no change. But then you talk about a tree being planted that's different. That changes things. And then not only is the tree planted, but it yields its fruit in its season. Why is fruit important? Because you can tell uh, a blessed man by, by the fruit that that person is yielding. You can tell if this person is planted by the fruit in their lives. And what's interesting about it is uh, fruit is not for the tree. <laughs> a, a tree can't eat its own fruit. The, the fruit is for, for, for somebody else. The fruit is for other people. So the fruit that God is trying to bear in my life is not solely about me and who I am. The blessed man does these things for other people. The blessed man is going to live his life for others. You know the perfect example of a blessed man who lives his life for others? 
Jesus. You want to talk about somebody who, who, who lived their life and, and their fruit was on display for other people. It is a beautiful picture because Jesus, his whole life was not concerned about himself. Jesus, his entire life was not concerned about other people. This entire, so I wasn't going to say this to the end, but I just got hyped. This entire psalm is not, is, is not, about, it is not about us. This entire psalm is a perfect picture of who Jesus is. You see, Jesus is the blessed man that this psalm is talking about. He, 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 we can't do this apart from him. It's, it's not possible. So when he talks about yielding the fruit in his season, he's talking about doing things that are uh, putting other people uh, before ourselves. And what God said was, man, my son is going to do that wholeheartedly. Why? Because you and me need a savior. Amen. Yes, sir. We need new dirt. <laughs> we need to be planted. We need to be moved from who we were to now who Christ is. We need to be moved from those things. So he plants us and we yield that fruit in its season. It says, and its leaf does not wither. Now, what this is talking about, because some people, because it says in all that he does, he prospers. Some people, they take that and they run out of context with it because they think as Christians, we're not going to go through things. We're not going to struggle. We're not going to be in bad spots. And the reality is we are. We live in a sinful place that is ran by a sinful man in Satan. They call him the prince of the power of the air. He's controlling this thing. He, he, he is the one that, that, that will put you in a bad spot on purpose. He did it to Jesus. So if he's going to put Jesus in a bad spot, how much more do you think he's going to be willing to put you in a bad spot? But the question is, when you get to that bad spot, are you planning Because if you're planted, the Bible says that you have streams of water, which means that they won't wither. <coughs> You know God has heard you. I love in uh, Philippians when Paul is talking about this because he says, he says, when you pray, when you think on these things, he says, the God of peace will be with you. So even though I'm struggling and going through things, I still have the peace of God and then also the God of peace. It says he will be with you. He doesn't say you won't go through things because Paul was getting ready to die. So you, you will go through things but he's with you. And because he's with you, that means that you have leaves that won't wither. You won't allow these, these, these tough times to, to get you down or to destroy your life or to cause you to stop. But in everything you do, you will prosper. Why is that? Why? Man, that dude just got laid off. Why is he still walking around with a smile? Because his leaves aren't withering. Man, you just had somebody you love pass away, man. Why, 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 are you, why are you still happy? My leaves are not withering because I know who is with me. I know who is walking with me. I know where I'm planted. God's got me. Even despite my earthly circumstances, even despite the things that I go through on this side of eternity. But he says, the wicked are not like this. So you get this idea of being planted. You get this idea of being secure. You get this idea of being stable. And it says the wicked are not like this. It says they are like shaft that the wind drives away. And if you know anything about the winnowing process, uh, what they would do is they would take this wheat and wheat would have this uh, like shell around it called shaft. And what they would do is they would take this, um, this wheat and in order to separate these two things, the good from the bad, they would throw it up in the air. When they would toss it, the wind would be able to separate these things. So you have a picture of, of, of shaft that, that is just nothing. The wind blows left, it goes left. The wind blows right, it goes right. So there is this picture of, of, of something that's not planted. It's unstable. But I love that he says that because we also get the stability of a tree. We were talking on Wednesday and we were talking about um, 
just kind of what this looks like. And, and Scott brought up, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in um, dang, I just had a brain fart. it. <laughs> My fault. Um, but uh, in, in Broad Run Park, they have these streams. And sometimes if you ever walk Broad Run Park, you will be able to see that when these uh, streams get low enough, you see these trees and you see how massive they are. But underneath the tree, you see these root structures. And these root structures are very, very impressive. Actually amazing because they wind, they go through, they connect, they do all these things. And as we were talking, it reminded me of root structures of the trees in California. They have these big trees in California called redwoods. If you know anything about redwoods, redwoods can grow almost to 300 foot tall. Things are humongous. Not only do they grow almost 300 foot tall, they're also 40 feet wide. So when those things fall, they're still bigger than you. They're humongous. And the thing about these redwoods, and I think it is so cool, is that uh, these trees are so massive and they hang out together so much that, the, the, that some scientists say that when a north wind hits these trees, they turn into a south wind. That means they're not dictated by how the wind is moving. But we get a picture here of some shaft that's dictated by how the wind is moving. And what that tells me is that when I'm planted and rooted in God's word, he says, I'm, I can turn Satan's north wind into a south wind. I can tell this wind, man, get away from me. I'm not worried about it because I'm not shaft. I'm not something that's just going to get tossed up and thrown away. I can be firmly planted. And it gives me strength. Why? Because I'm planted in a person. I'm not planted in things. I'm not planted in, in, in stuff. I'm not planted in position. I'm not planted in power. I'm not planted in, 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 in my profit. I'm planted in a person. And the person is of Jesus Christ. So he says, the wicked are not like this. He says, the shaft. And then the last question I want to ask as I close up, the question on the floor is, where, where will you stand? At the end of the day, where are you going to be? Two paths, your choice. He ends this and he says, uh, he says, therefore, the reason why it says therefore is because he says, I want you to take into account everything that I just said. I want you to take into account how a person lives. I want you to take into account how a person acts, how a person thinks. Take all that into account, therefore. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked, it will perish. So we got two destinations from two different walks of life. You have wicked and you have righteous. And he says the wicked won't do these things. And I think about the word wicked and it's, you know. The wicked are the people that go against God's word. The, pe- the wicked are the people that don't come to God on his terms. And he says the wicked and the righteous will have two separate destinations. But right now we get to make that choice. He says the wicked, they're not, gonna, they're not even going to have a leg to stand on. That's, <laughs> that's different. Because sometimes right now the wicked look like they have a leg to stand on. Sometimes right now it looks like, man, that path will be easier. Sometimes it looks like, man, that path will be worth it. Because they got a lot of stuff going on that's good right now. And the Bible never promises that. It doesn't promise us prosperity. It doesn't promise us a beautiful lifestyle. In fact, the people that this book is about that is written in, that's written in here, A lot of these people died, and it wasn't pleasant. So for us, sometimes it's real easy to say, man, that lifestyle looks really good. Let me run to that. But he's leaving us with a warning here, and he says, listen, the wicked, they won't even have a, they they can't stand. They won't be in the congregation when the judgment comes. So what he's saying is be real cautious before you decide to make that choice. Because you have to understand that this thing does not play out well for those who go against God's law and those who go against God's instruction. 
And then we get a picture of the righteous. And the question we have to ask is, man, what is righteousness? What does that righteousness look like? And if I can have a definition of righteousness, this is the standard by which God judges the people. It's perfect. The question is, who is righteous? Who are these righteous people that will get an opportunity to stand in front of God and be accepted by him? Got some bad news. (laughs) Because here's what it says in Romans chapter 3. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. No one. The Greek translation for no one is no one. (laughs) That means nobody is exempt. So we have to ask ourselves, man, if no one is righteous, then how do we get to that point? That's why I'm so grateful that the Bible doesn't end right there. How do we get to this righteousness? There is only one way that we get to this righteousness. Only one. And we, 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 we can't go around it. We can't go over it. My kids got a song they listen to. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You can't go around it. So I guess you just got to go through it. And the question is, who is that person? 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this, for our sake, for our sake, that means for me, for you, the ones who have been in this wicked state in our lives, for our sake, sake he made him who knew no sin he made the righteous unrighteous he made the person who was perfect take the place of the imperfect and it says that he made him that knew no no sin so that in him Not in me, not in my stuff, not in my things, in him, in the person of Jesus Christ, in him. He says, because of that, we now become the righteousness of God. In him, the person that knew no sin, the spotless lamb. your place and at the end of that we have a decision that we have to make as you're driving down this highway of life are you going to stay in your lane of wickedness or are you going to trust God to allow you to move to his lane of perfect righteousness there's a story as I close In uh, 1929, there was a man named George Wilson. And in 1929, George Wilson, he was uh, convicted of murdering a mail carrier. And his punishment was death. He was on death row. And he had a really good lawyer. Really good lawyer. His lawyer got his case all the way up to the Supreme Court. And then it eventually reached the Oval Office and it landed on the president's desk. And the president looked over his case. And what the president did in that moment when he saw this guy's case, he knew he was guilty. He knew what he did was wrong and the president still said, I'm going to pardon him for what he did. So the president writes out this big list or this, this, this long letter of why Mr. Wilson should be pardoned. And the letter ends up getting to Mr. Wilson. And I don't know about you, but if if I know I murdered somebody and I know the consequence of murder is me being killed, somebody pardons me, I'm going to be happy about that. 
I'm going to celebrate the fact that I still get to draw breath on this side of eternity. George Wilson didn't do that. George Wilson said, I don't want it. He said, I'm good. This is one of the first times in American history that someone said no to a pardon. Hadn't happened before. So they did not know how to respond to this. So they had meetings. They got together. They had conversations about how are we going to go about this God that doesn't want to be pardoned for something that he did against the law. And here's what the Chief Justice Marshall came up with. He said, unless the pardoner accepts the pardon, the pardon is null and void. There's two sides to it. So unless the guy who did the crime accepts the pardon from the president, he can't be pardoned from his crimes. It's not possible. So they got together, they had this conversation, they sent that to Mr. Wilson, and Mr. Wilson, he, he died. He made the choice to say, nah, I'm good. If you're here this morning, I don't want you to say, I'm good. God has given us the opportunity to be pardoned. He has placed in our, in our midst the, the opportunity to say, you know what? Uh, uh, yeah, you don't, have, you don't have to die. You don't have to leave, leave this earth without security of where you're going to be when you leave. But we have to accept that. We have to understand that. Because if we don't, we can end up like Mr. Wilson. And God is saying, I don't want you to end up so at the end of the day, there's two paths you can take. It's your choice. And pray for us. God, I thank you so much for your word. And God, I thank you for your grace. God, I thank you that we're able to open up your word and, 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 and walk through it. God, I'm so grateful that on the cross, you satisfied your anger and your wrath against sin in your son, Jesus Christ. And you have pardoned us of all of our sins. Father God, I pray that as we continue in song and worship and as we enter into a time of response, Father God, that you will open hearts to come to you. Father God, allow us to understand just how far you truly travel for us to continue to be in relationship with you. God, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.